Well, I want to get into the message today, and I want to make sure that I stay on time. So I want you to be seated. And while I'm talking to you, I want you to go to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I want to make sure I'm talking to people. You know, one of the things that we have in life is we have our image. Can I tell you, we all look better right now than we did when our eyes opened and we looked at ourselves in the mirror in the bathroom. We thought, "Uh uh-oh, I've got to fix some things. I've got to brush my teeth. I've got to comb my hair. That young man, you. The law of attraction does not work. I've been looking for hair for 10 years. And all God lets me do is see it on you. I remember when I used to have hair. I was 12. You know, the problem is we have a faith walk. We have a grace walk. But this treasure is in an earthen vessel. And so I want to confess to you that God's hand is on my life. God's spirit is on my life. But I have issues. Did anybody have issues? I get on an airplane two to three times a week. And very seldom do I not have an issue on an airplane. And it's when it lands. We get to the gate, and they open the door. And the flight attendant, instead of just opening the door, they talk to the person that opened the door. You don't need to talk to the person. We just want to get off the plane. I don't know what you're saying, but it's taking my time. And then, depending on how far back in the plane I am, I watch people don't get off the plane. They get up, get their clo- their suitcase, get their purse, stuff things in it. There's nobody between them and the door. They're so slow. And I'm thinking, I can't redeem the time because you're too slow to get off the airplane. And so I catch myself becoming impatient. I drive a lot. I don't like it when I get in the fast lane and there's a slow person. I want to have one of those bumpers on the front of my car. Just run into them and put them in the ditch like NASCAR. You ought not to have been in front of me going that slow. Mm Mm-hmm. You ever go through a buffet line? How hard can it be to make a decision of what you want to put on your plate? And you see people with a spoon in their hand. There's a place that I like to go in Tennessee. It's called Casey Jones Buffet. It's between Nashville and Memphis. And they make what they call hoe cakes, which is cornbread, but it's real flat like a pancake. And they get it on the griddle, and they only cook them every 30 minutes. And so I wait till I see them start to cook them, and I get in line to go through the buffet so I can get a hot one that I can put butter on. I got in line behind a tall lady and a very elderly lady, probably in her 90s. She was frail. And the older lady leaves her mother. And the really frail lady is in front of me, and I'm like, my whole cake's going to get cold. My whole cake's going to get cold. And I'm thinking, good night, this woman. She's not... And she looks at me, and and she can't get the spoon out of the potatoes. And she looked at me, and she said, Mr., could you put some potatoes on my plate? Something changed inside of me. I went from serving me to serving somebody else. 
all the impatience was gone. I'll never forget, I put some potatoes on her plate, and then I had to carry it because she couldn't carry the plate with the potatoes. And she asked me to put some gravy on her potatoes. Well, I put a little bit of gravy on there. She was a little old lady. And she said, no, sir, I likes me some gravy. Could you put some gravy on my... I put gravy on there, and I'll never forget, she patted me on the chest, and she said, son, eat lots of gravy. It keeps your heart greased up. (laughs) Sometimes in life, you need to understand what's going on. And rather than being such a patient, impatient, when I get just a little bit older, not much, maybe I'm that person driving in the slow lane because I'm older. Maybe I'm that person that can't get my potatoes. You know, understanding your issues is incredibly important and how God made you because you're going to have battles in life. You're going to have struggles. Has anybody in here ever been lied about? Anybody ever lied about you? Yeah. All leaders have been lied about. Anybody in here ever cheated you? Anybody in here ever been hurt? That's when the issues come out. And when the issues come out, it allows God to work on the inside. Dr. Chan is a dear friend of mine, Sam Chan, a friend of this ministry and your pastors. And he was telling me what I work with pastors. He said, you call them. And he said, when you have a meeting they pay for, then don't see them until the next meeting because you can't carry all those burdens. And he wanted me to be able to serve more people by not being overburdened. But I, and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't be like him. And then it dawned on me when I got saved. I got saved in jail after I committed a murder. And I've shared that testimony with you years ago. And when I got saved, God took a heart that had no love for anybody else. No care for anybody else. No compassion. No empathy. And he gave me a heart to love people. And I told Dr. Chen, I don't want to do anything that makes me stop caring. I don't want to ever go back. I want to become more loving and more sensitive. As you're growing in your spiritual life, you're going to deal with the enemy. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided Negev and Ziklag, and they had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept until they, could, they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Hinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. And Abiathar brought it to him. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue the ra- this raiding party? Will I overtake them? And God said, pursue them. He answered, you will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. It's an interesting story. Someone dies. You lose a job. There's a flood, a fire. The country shuts down your business for COVID. And you lose everything you've worked for all your life because of government regulation. You lose a loved one during COVID because of scientists manufacturing diseases. Do you understand no matter how good we look today, we've all had heartache. We've all experienced hurt. We've all experienced the enemy in one shape, fashion, form, or another. What do you do 
when you've been doing everything you know to do right. David and his men were out fighting for the kingdom of God and the nation of Israel. And the enemy comes and takes everything they have worked for and every person they love. Gone. <coughs> what do you do? Let me give it to you real quick this morning. Number one, you weep. You cry. The Bible says that they wept until they had no more power to weep. David and 600 men. These are not women. These are not children. These are mighty, mighty men. Wept until they could weep no more. <coughs> Sometimes we think I, I should not show my emotion. Stoicism. Thank you, Bishop. <laughs> Stoicism is not faith. You say, well, if I don't show emotion, I'm a man of faith. No, you're not. Hiding the truth is not a manifestation of faith. I'm in denial. That's not faith either. You heard about the three preachers that went to hell. One was a Methodist, one was a Baptist, and one was a faith preacher. And the Methodist said, I thought I was saved, but I must not have been saved. I was saved last week, but I didn't get saved this week, and I must have done something wrong, and so I'm in hell because I lost my salvation. And the Baptist, who believe in eternal security, that believe once saved, always saved, thought I must have been mistaken. I was never saved. And the faith preacher was walking around confessing, it's not hot and I'm not here. Can I tell you, you can deny the truth. It does not change the facts. You can't be stoic and you can't be in denial to deal with the real issues. Your homes, your family, possessions are gone. But that's okay to cry. Abraham wept over Sarah. Jacob wept over Rachel. Joseph wept over the reunion with his brothers. Hezekiah wept over a bad medical report. Jeremiah wept over the sins of Israel. Peter wept over his failure. And Jesus Christ wept. It's okay to weep until you can weep no more. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 said there's a time to weep. And a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. You can't get stuck in that. Well, I'm weeping. Well, how long? See, most people don't give themselves a limit. You're not in charge of you, and you should be. Do not allow your emotions to control your life. His anger is for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, David has taken his men out and they're camped out under the mulberry trees. And that word mulberry in Hebrew it refer, it's called a weeping tree. It's when you were weeping, you went out under the mulberry trees and you wept. But God said, and you shall hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the mulberry trees. Then you shall advance quickly and the Lord will go before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. What God is saying to David, it's okay to get under the mulberry trees, but once I show up and I begin to march over the top of you're weeping there's going to be a victory that comes and you don't stay under the mulberry trees forever you stay under the mulberry trees for a moment until the master makes some noise and when he makes some noise you're going to have some victory so you need to learn to weep it's okay number two don't get bitter don't get bitter how many bitter people do we life's not fair Life's not fair to anybody. Well, Brother Davis, I got church hurt. Do you know anybody that didn't get church hurt? Everybody gets church hurt. Jesus got church hurt, and he got over it in three days. You got mama hurt. You got daddy hurt. 
I can still remember the sound of the marching when my dad pulled that belt out of his pants and you could hear that belt going through those belt, belt, belt loops. And you knew you were fixing to get a whooping. Mama, no, you can't have dessert because you didn't eat all your food. But mama, I don't want to eat the asparagus. Doesn't matter. You don't get to choose what you eat. When I grew up, we didn't cater, they didn't cater to us. Mama cooked for daddy, and we got to eat what daddy ate. There was only one king in the house. Kids were not king. Nobody that is a consumer should be in control of the contributor. The Bible says in verse number 6 that David was greatly distressed for the people talk of stoning him. It, isn't it interesting? These men that were with David were the men that came to him in the wilderness, and they were distressed, and they were, they were, the, they were the rejects. They didn't have wives. They didn't have kids. They didn't have anything until they met David. And the man that gave them everything, now they blame him because they don't have what they didn't have when they met him. The difference in a leader and a follower is a follower always has somebody to blame. A leader finds an answer. You ever listen to your politicians? It's always the other people's fault. A leader finds an answer. In America, we have so many lawsuits. Like if a child falls out of a tree and breaks an arm... The, the, the police officers may charge the parents with child neglect. Since Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, kids have fallen out of trees. <laughs> kids hurt themselves because they're kids. They fall off bicycles. They fall off trees. They can't walk down the street. They have to walk on the curb. If, if the kid was up here, he'd be over here trying to walk on the edge of the stage because they're kids. They jump off stuff thinking, I'm Superman. I had a younger brother, and he had a Superman outfit when we were kids. He was about five, and he said, I can fly. I said, well, get up on the house. And I said, fly off the house. He jumped off the roof of the house. He hurt himself. I got a whooping. He had to go to the doctor. My parents didn't get sued. My parents didn't get charged. We get bitter about so many things. That, you know, why did this happen? So, who knows? Whose fault is it? Can, can we say sometimes it's not anybody's fault? It just happens. You have a flat tire. Whose fault is it? Bitterness and blame. My favorite person in the New Testament is the woman at the well. We would say, that's a bad woman. But Jesus said, hey, come here. Put his arm around her and said, I want you to go tell those people that I'm here. The person we reject, Jesus used. You know why? Because she didn't get bitter I hate men. Men are bad. I'm not ever marrying another man. I'm going to be alone the rest of my life. Every man I've ever married has been a rotten, low-down, no-good man. But she said, no, no, I was made for a man. I'm going to keep getting married till I get it right. No, I'll find one sooner or later. And I'm not promoting divorce, but what I'm saying is she didn't get bitter. And when you don't get bitter, you can get better. These guys were, when they met David, they were in distress, they were in debt, they were discontented people. But Jesus made them mighty men of God. And you say, how did they turn on Jesus? They had issues they had not dealt with. The flesh is strong. Do not think, well, I would never do that. You don't know what you would do if you put yourself in the wrong situation. Now, I'm old enough that most of temptation has kind of passed me. 
except food. <laughs> Mari, did you see that young girl? No, but did you see that apple pie right over there? <laughs> I didn't see her. Last night, Pastor Malden took me to eat, and we had a great steak. But I had him take me to a little shop there at the Empress where Bishop gave me my first Magnum bar. And I said, I don't really want to. He said, do you want to have dessert in the restaurant? I said, no, 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 no. I want to go right over there and have a Magnum bar. We don't have those where I live in America. I want to go over there and have a Magnum bar. And I'll have a Magnum bar every day if I get over there. I'm going to get me one of them. And you say, you probably ought not to be eating all that ice cream at your age. Is one of the reasons I went bald, just so you know. And uh, <laughs> I had a Magnum. And people say, you know, you, you probably ought not to be having that much sugar. I know. But it was a Magnum bar. You say, well, you try to be disciplined and stay healthy, I know. But the flesh <laughs> wants what it wants. I need to be doing push-ups. But I'd rather go eat a Magna bar. <laughs> I need to be doing sit-ups. But I'm going to eat another Magna bar. The chocolatey chocolate one next time. And then I'm going to eat the almond Magna bar. I'm going to eat one of every kind while I'm here. You say, well, you know better. I know better. But the flesh wants what it wants. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, looking carefully, lest any fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many people are found. See, people say, well, you can't mess up grace. That's not what that just said. It said you can fall short. You can experience the grace of God and fall short of the grace of God by allowing bitterness to rise up within you. And when bitterness rises up, you don't just poison yourself. You poison everybody around you. You hurt other people. Well, Brother Murray, you don't know what happened to me. I don't know what happened to you, but whatever happened to you is not greater than what God can do for you. You need to not get stuck in what happened. Jesus said it this way in Luke 17. It is impossible that no offense should come. Everybody's got a choice to be offended. You can get offended or you can get over it. You got to weep until you can weep no more. Get it out. Don't be bitter. And number three, you need to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. David wrote that two years before Ziklag. In the middle of the rubble, in the middle of the mess, in the middle of your weeping, in the middle of your brokenness, if you will open your mouth and give thanks to God, something supernatural will happen in the realm of the spirit around you. It will flow out of you. We begin to talk about the goodness of God. You know, one day I had a bad day. I was I, I was embarrassed. I was horribly embarrassed. And I went home, and people had brought up all of the things I'd ever done wrong before I got saved. And I was so ashamed. And I sat down at my desk, and I thought, God, I've got to preach tomorrow. I can't. I, you, 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 I, I'm empty right now. I feel like I need to just crawl in a hole and never go out again. And I took a piece of paper out, and I began to write the top ten things Jesus Christ had done in my life. And I wrote down when the psychiatrist said there was no hope. God said, I'm a God of hope. If you'll come to me, I can fix that. And I began to write down, and as I wrote down the things that God had done over the last 30 years, the spirit of shame got pushed down, and the spirit of victory began to come up. And all of a sudden, I rose up from my desk in my office in my house, and I said, God, you're a good God, and you call me 
me regardless of my past and you have given me a hope and a future that's not tied to my sin. It's tied to the blood of Jesus Christ. And as I begin to praise God, something began to happen. And regardless of what had happened that day, what happened in that moment got me ready to serve God. Habakkuk is one of the great books of the Bible. It's only three chapters. You can read it in just a moment. In the first part of Habakkuk, he's crying, he's complaining, he's whining. God, why do the wicked prosper? Why don't you do something? It would, you know, wouldn't it seem like God would go ahead and judge Hamas? Would, wouldn't God judge Iraq? Wouldn't God judge Iran? The people that want to kill the children of God and the Christians in the world today, wouldn't it seem like God wants to do something with them? And, you know, he's, uh, he's upset. It's not fair. And by the third chapter, he goes into that scripture Though the fig tree may not blossom, though there be no fruit on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herds in the stall. In other words, if everything goes wrong, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on the highest. Man, all of a sudden, this guy that started off so bad is saying, let me tell you, I don't care what's going on. My God is a good God. He'll lift me up. He'll raise me up. He'll bless me coming in. He'll bless me going out. He'll make me the head and not the tail. You say, what did God do in that whole book? God didn't do anything. Habakkuk changed his attitude. Praise changes our perspective. And a man who knows how to strengthen himself will stand out from men that don't. You say, Maury, how did you learn how to do that? I didn't have an option. I got saved in jail on my way to prison. My cell was five foot wide and nine foot long for eight and a half years. You say, well, what did you do about loneliness? I laid on a concrete floor and cried out to God. What did you do about depression? I laid on a concrete floor. I learned how to pray all by myself because there was no one else to, there, to be there. The pastor couldn't come. My mother couldn't come. My brothers and sisters, my father couldn't come. The other inmates, many of them did not care. They weren't Christians. If I could find victory in a cell, and you're sitting in the middle of people of faith, if one will put 1,000 to flight, two will put 10,000 to flight. You're in a position to get to a place of victory. Weep until you can weep no more. Don't get bitter. Encourage yourself in the Lord. And number four, get a word from God. You need to hear from God. You say, well, I was watching the news. Well, the news is not going to encourage you. It's just going to make you mad. The news is not built to build faith. Verse 8 of 1 Samuel 30. So David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue them, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. David, David had gone through the whole process, and now he's ready to hear a word from God. He's ready to get a word from God. And God says, here it is. He puts himself in position. He calls for the high priest. He puts on the garment and he gets in a place. To, you know, the Bible says we enter to his gates with thanksgiving, into its courts with praise. We come in the name of Jesus. And if we ask anything in his name, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we are confident that we have that which we've asked. We, we operate in the word of God. We operate in the spirit of God to get a word from God. Ten words. Overtake them. Pursue them. You shall surely overtake them and recover all. Five seconds after all night in prayer, after the weeping and the dealing with the bitterness and strengthening yourself in the Lord. Five words, all of a sudden God speaks. And when God speaks into your spirit, there is an indomitable faith that will rise up. And you're not going to let go of it because you know I have heard the King of kings and the Lord of lords give me a personal promise that I'm going to recover all. Number five. Get mad at the devil. Man, I get mad at people. I shared that with you, didn't I? 
Most of it has to do with anything that requires patience. I hate James. I hate those scriptures in James. Count it all joy when you encounter various trials. Ends up so that patience can have its perfect work in you. <laughs> patience. You may not have to go through a problem that lasts so I can be who I'm supposed to be. Hey, God, did you know I have issues? <laughs> Every now and then I'm with people like your bishop, and I'm like, let's go. These people are in the way. I think I told you that yesterday. There's people are in the way. Everybody's moving slow around here. Pastor Malden. Yeah, it'd be all right. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, we need to be going. I mean, these, you know, everything you do is slow. You check in at a hotel. They, they ask each other, how's your family? I don't want to know your family. I just want to go to the room. I'm tired. I've got to get my clothes out. I don't care about your family. I'm never going to see you again. Just give me my, my, my key to my room. And my wife. She's like this angel person. She knows all of our neighbors. She knows where they came from, who their kids are, what, where they went to school, what they do for a living. She goes, do you know those people? I said, never saw them. I, I come in, I drive in the garage, I shut the door, I go in the house. That's my refuge. All those people are projects. I work with projects all day. I go home to be a project free. <laughs> My wife, she just laid back. I don't know about you, Bishop. I drive and she rides over there doing nothing. <laughs> and I pull up in the garage. And you need to understand, I pull up in the garage. I put the car in park. I hit the thing. I open the door and I get out. And it's like park out. And I look in the window. And she's putting stuff back in her purse. I can be in the house, take my coat off, get a Coke before she comes in the door. And then she's irritated that I didn't wait on her. And I said, did you not know we were going home? I mean, it's the same house we lived in this year and last year and we drive down the street. When we go down the street, we're going to go in that garage. And I'm going to shut the door and get out of the car. Why don't you put all that stuff that you get out of your purse back in your purse before we go in the garage? Why do you take all that stuff out of your purse? Why do you have to have stuff everywhere? Just put the purse up and just sit there. But I've learned. To not show it. So now I drive up. She says, you can go in if you want to. I said, oh, no, baby. <laughs> I'm going to wait on you. <laughs> we get mad at people for being people rather than getting mad at the devil. You get mad at the preacher. I didn't like what he said. I didn't like that joke. I didn't like the way he interpreted the scripture. I didn't like you talking about the science of the law of attraction and it's not spiritual. I don't like your hair. You get mad at your spouse, you get mad at your preacher, you get mad at your boss, you get mad at your kids, you get mad at people that you don't know driving slow, you get mad at people going slow through the buffet. We are not supposed to get mad at any other human being. The enemy is not a person, it is a spirit, and it is Satan himself. The enemy of our lives is the devil. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood.
And number six, you need to learn to recover all. I love this promise. David recovered everything and more that the enemy took from him. When you're going through a battle, you need to make up your mind, I can recover from this pain. In 2013, when I was diagnosed with a, an untreatable cancer with a two-year life expectancy, I said, I'm not going to let the doctor's report be greater in my spirit than the blood. You can recover from devastation. People said, you went to prison for committing a murder. You're never going to get out, and if you do get out, you'll never do anything significant. But we, we serve a way maker. Yes. You can recover from failure. You can recover your health. You can recover your destiny. I had a Sunday school teacher in prison. His name was Tommy Thompson. I'd never been to church. I just got saved and started going to church and got to go to Sunday school. And Tommy had been in prison about eight years by the time I started listening to him. He was a faith guy. The Word of God is infallible. It's perfect. You can build your life on it. If God said it, trust it. And one day I watched my example of faith, my inmate pastor, so to speak, go through a day that I've never seen another human being go through. He was supposed to get out of prison. He had received his papers that the governor had signed that you're going to get out of prison in a couple of weeks. The date was set. And they called him to the warden's office, and he came back, and he just looked defeated. I said, what happened? He said, they've changed their mind. They're not going to let me out of prison this year. In all of my years of prison, that's the only time I saw that happen. I said, well, how do you handle that? He said, I don't know. But he said, my life is in God's hands. God knows. I thought, wow. I'd be mad. I'd be broken. I would talk, start talking to God if this is not fair. Why me, Lord? Later on that day, the chaplain stopped by and said, hey, Tommy, I had this letter hand-delivered from your fiance today. And it was a lady that had waited for eight and a half years for him to get out of prison to get married. And it was a Dear John letter of why she couldn't wait anymore. And I watched my man of faith, my, my example of how to walk with Jesus, as tears ran down his eyes. And he said, I can't blame her. I could be in here for another 12 years. She can't stop living her life. He wasn't bitter towards her, but man... The woman that had been there for him for eight and a half years was gone. And I thought, wow. Just watching to see how a man of God handles the pain. Later on that night, they called him, and he went to the chaplain's office, and we came back. He sat down across from me, and he was sobbing. I mean sobbing, which inmates don't do. Sobbing. And I said, Tommy, what happened? He said, my 21-year-old son was found dead in his apartment today. He choked by himself on a chicken bone. And he crumbled there on that chair, just sobbing. And as a baby Christian, I thought, God, if the devil can do that to him, what's he going to do to me? And all of a sudden, I watched that man clench his fist. And he began to just tap on his leg. And I heard him talking. I couldn't hear what he was saying. And then I realized he was talking to himself. I will not quit. I will not quit. And as he said it over and over, the strength began to come to his voice because God inhabits our language. God inhabits our praise. I will not quit. And I thought if the devil can do that and he can stand that, there's nothing the devil can do to me that's going to make me quit. I'm going to make it for Jesus Christ. I will not quit. Walk with me for just a moment. 
is King David and 600 men that have a word from God. Go and you shall overtake them, recover all. And go into that area where those people that have taken their wives and their children and all their stuff are there. And they take their swords out. And there's a battle going on. And there's blood and there's guts and there's gore. And there's sweat and there's fear and there's being pain. And you're being cut and they're being cut. And at the end of the day when David stands there with blood all over his hands. And his hands so tired they can no longer grip the sword. And he drops the sword and he's standing there thinking we have won this battle. And all of a sudden, two women and his children come to him. And he opens his arms. Takes his family back. Recovers all. You may be sitting here today. And the enemy has come. You're stuck in weeping and you need to get out. You're battling with bitterness and you need a breakthrough. You need to get to God and strengthen yourself in the Lord. You need to get a word from God so that you know what God says in your life. If you're in any of those areas today, I want to pray for you. Would you just stand up right where you are if you need prayer in those areas? Whether it's the weeping or the bitterness or you need to strengthen yourself or you need a word from God, I want you to stand up right where you are. If you need to recover something that the enemy has taken from you, I want you to stand up right where you are. Uh Mm. Could you come to the front? Could you step out now? Come to the front and come all the way down here. Just crowd in come on come all the way up come all the way up no no bring them all the way to the stage come all the way to the stage come on mm-hmm. just come all the way so everybody can get as close as possible hallelujah Just keep coming. Just keep coming. Just keep coming. church, I'm going to ask you to stretch out your faith towards the people at the front of this building because I believe the Spirit of God wants to give you a breakthrough. I believe He wants to bring an end to the weeping and laughter comes. It's time to laugh. I believe He wants to deliver you from bitterness to where you get a sweetness of your spirit again. I believe He wants you to be encouraged where your faith rises up. And I believe he wants you to have a word from God so you know the direction God is taking you. You know what God's plan is for your life. I believe he wants you to identify the enemy. And it's not who you think it is, it's the devil. The devil is your enemy. And I believe he wants you to recover all. You believe that? Can we agree on that? The Bible says if we agree on anything in his name, he'll do it. So we're fixing to have some answers to prayer. Come on, church. Let's pray with these folks. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come into your incredible presence. And God, we give you praise that you're an ever-present God. You're here in this room. Your spirit is in this room. The presence of the living God is in this room and at these altars to meet the needs of the people according to your riches and glory. God, we're not counting on our own ability, our own intellect, our own IQ, our own talents, our own giftings. We are counting on you, the supernatural King of kings and the Lord of lords to intervene in the lives of people. God, 
God, there are people here that have been broken and they've been weeping and they've been grieving and they've, they've lost loved ones and they've had things taken from them that have broken them. God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, a spirit of joy, a spirit of joy would come upon the people and they would laugh their way into victory. They would laugh their way. They would rejoice. They would magnify your name. They would hear the sound of the marching in the mulberry trees and the weeping would stop. God, I pray that there are people that have had the root of bitterness trying to take over their life. You would deliver them, God, and give them a sweet, sweet spirit. Allow the power of the Holy Spirit to come in their lives and give them a spirit of reconciliation, a spirit of love, a spirit of forgiveness, a spirit of victory, and a spirit of joy. God, I pray that there are people here that would learn to strengthen themselves in the Lord and that they would begin to magnify your name. They would magnify what you've done. They would thank you for saving their soul and sending your son. They would thank you for giving them a word that is a light to the feet and a lamp to their path. They would thank you for giving them truth that will set them free. They would thank you, God, for giving them the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. They would thank you for giving them a pastor and a bishop. They would thank you for giving them a mother and a father. They would thank you for giving them family and the family of God so that they would go to heaven. They would thank you that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when this life ends, they are not going to go to a place called hell, but they will see you, God, face to face, walking on streets of gold by the crystal river. They would pass through gates of pearl, and they would see the saints of old. God, I pray that you would allow them to hear your word for the specific situation that they're in, and you would speak to them and give them a promise, God, to take them from where they are to where they need to be, from what they've lost to what they need to gain, from where they don't know where to go to where they do need to go. God, let them hear your voice in their spirit and their mind and their soul. And God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, you would allow them to recover all. We bind the spirit of the enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy, and we allow the spirit of promise, God, to come on their lives that they are going to recover all. And when they do recover all, they're going to look around and say, God, you're a good God. Christ, you're a great Savior. Spirit, you're a mighty spirit. And we are the people of the living God who cannot be defeated, who cannot be stopped, who cannot be denied. We have a promise from the Father, and we recover all in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people gave a shout unto God, hallelujah, hallelujah. In just a few moments, they're going to start baptizing people. I'm in churches all over America that haven't baptized five people this year. There are churches that God has got his hand on and churches that God is trying to get in. You need to rejoice. You're in a church that is alive. So, Siloam, it's been good to be with you. I love you. God bless you.